Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NEC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts and to educate people in the fine arts. Annually, we host a over 150 free programs um, to the public, including exhibitions, um, the theatrical performances, musical performances, readings, and lectures. To learn more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Today we're joined by Adam Higginbotham, author of Midnight in Chernobyl, The Untold Story of the World's Greatest Nuclear Disaster, and skilled moderator and host of the Brooklyn-based Page Turner's reading series, Glenn Rauscher. Following the conversation between Adam and Glenn will be a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A function. And without further ado, let me pass the baton on to Glenn. Enjoy the program. Thank you very much, Nadine. Um, my name is Glenn Rauscher, the current host of the Page Turners, formerly Half King Reading Series. I uh, want to thank the National Arts Club for making me a part of this. Thanks to Nadine. Thanks to Rose. Uh, it's it's a, a wonderful thing to be able to, to be here with, with them tonight. Um, and as for you who are joining us remotely, um, even when we are still somewhat shut down here in New York, uh, we know that there's 10,000 different places that you can choose to be all over the internet and elsewhere. And none of us involved with putting together and doing this event take for granted that you've chosen to be here with us. So thank you very, very much for that. I know I have a number of dear friends tuning in and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, your reward is to have an evening with the author of Midnight in Chernobyl, Adam Hickenbotham. Um, as Nadine said, we're going to have a conversation, Adam and I, but we also want you to be part of that conversation. So there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please feel free to put your questions, and I'd like to emphasize questions, in the Q&A function. I'll be monitoring that throughout our conversation, and we'll pick the finest of the questions to hand over to Adam. Uh, you also can get a copy of Midnight in Chernobyl, which I heartily uh, encourage you to do, from Books on Call NYC's bookshop.org page. That link will be shared in the chat of this event. All formats are available, and thank you for supporting hardworking authors and independent booksellers with your purchase this evening. After the event, after you've made your purchase, you will be able to get a signed book plate to affix to your book. They will come separately. Books on Call will reach out with information on getting your signed book plate at no extra charge. And now I'd like to introduce our featured author. In Midnight in Chernobyl, Adam Higginbotham, with writing that is both magnificently descriptive and economical and lean, finds the perfect way to describe each moment of this devastating story, placing us in the minds of the brave and foolish in the devastated landscapes and lives that he portrays in the book. His clarity with the science of both nuclear power and the endless unfolding of the post-meltdown events and responses allows the reader to easily incorporate details which enrich the understanding of the story and never for a moment take away from it. Given the terror with which the average person approaches anything scientific, including this reader, this is no small accomplishment. It makes the science underpinning nuclear power explicable, even as he renders the profound causes of the disaster inexplicable. Over and over, Adam lays bare the denial, incompetence, and deception that revealed a total system failure, as well as the inevitable failures of individuals working within the constraints of a broken system. He expertly manages the balancing act of taking us moment by moment but never letting us lose the larger picture of how each individual got to where they are and acted or did not act the way they did. And the extraordinary price so many paid in careers, in reputations, in health and in lives for trying to navigate the unnavigable. And most of all, he communicates almost unbearable but utterly necessary details and stories to relay the horror, destruction, 
an unimaginable human environmental tragedy of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in such a way that despite the profoundly disturbing tale, keeps us reading, caught in the moment, wondering, anticipating the next incredible turn. Please join me in welcoming Adam Hickenbotham. Thanks, Glenn. That's, <clears throat> that was very generous of you. <laughs> Well, every word is true as, as the song goes. <laughs> so um, thank you for doing this. Um, thank you for this incredible, incredible, incredible book, um, which as I, I said is, is as uh, amazing in the, the research and the accumulating of detail. It, the, it's, it's equal is your writing of it. And I, want, I wanted to give people, or we wanted to give people a taste of that. And for that, you're going to take us uh, somewhat far from Chernobyl. Can you can you give us a little bit of a taste of a section? Uh, I can from it's it's from sort of the middle of the book, but it, this is um, this is the slightly surprising way in which um, people outside the Soviet Union first learned uh, that something might have happened uh, within the borders of the USSR that they weren't telling anyone about. Um, so the accident happened on late on Friday night into Saturday morning of uh, April the 26th. Um, and this scene takes place a few days later. Shortly before seven o'clock on Monday morning, April the 28th, Cliff Robinson was eating breakfast in a coffee room of the Foshmark nuclear power station, 65 kilometers southeast of Garvel on the Gulf of Bothnia. Robinson, a 29-year-old technician in the plant's radiochemistry lab commuted to work each morning on a bus, bringing construction workers to Poshmark, where they were building a large underground repository for nuclear waste. When he had finished his coffee, Robinson stepped into the locker room to brush his teeth. On his way back, he passed through a radiation monitoring point and the alarm bell rang. Still half asleep, the technician was puzzled. He had only just arrived and hadn't yet entered the reactor block. He couldn't possibly be contaminated. But the alarm brought down a member of the plant radiation protection staff to whom Robinson explained what had happened. He walked through the detector again. Once more, the bell sounded. But on the third attempt, the monitor remained silent. Baffled, the two men decided that the equipment was faulty. Perhaps the alarm threshold had been miscalibrated. The dosimetrist told Robinson to go back to work. The machine could be fixed later. Coincidentally, Robinson's job in the lab was to measure radioactivity in Foshmark 1 within the station building and in what it expelled into the environment. The reactor was only six years old, but had been plagued by minor technical faults and leaking fuel rods had already led to several small radioactive releases that winter. His Monday morning routine took him first to the upper levels of the plant to gather air samples from the vent stack and then to the lab to analyze them. This took time. Around 9 a.m., he went back downstairs for another coffee. But when he approached the radiation monitoring point, he saw his path blocked by a long line of plant workers, each of whom was setting off the alarm bell. Now more perplexed than ever, Robinson took a shoe from one of the men, placed it in a plastic bag to prevent cross-contamination, and returned to the lab. He put the shoe on the germanium detector, a sensitive tool for measuring gamma rays, and prepared to wait. But the results returned with terrible speed, exploding in steep green peaks across the computer screen. Robinson's heart froze. He had never seen anything like it before. The shoe was intensely contaminated with the entire spectrum of fission products usually found inside the core at Foshmark 1. Cesium-137, cesium-134, and short-lived iodine isotopes, but also a number of other elements, including cobalt-60 and neptunium 239. These, he realized, could have originated only with nuclear fuel that had been exposed to the atmosphere. Robinson immediately telephoned his boss, who, fearing the worst, told him to return to the chimney stack and take a fresh set of air samples. At 9.30 a.m., the plant manager, Carl Eric Sandstedt, was alerted to the contamination, but the senior staff of Foshmark remained as confused by it as Robinson had been. They couldn't trace it backward to a source within the plant. And yet, given the weather conditions, radiation levels on the ground outside conformed to what they would expect of a major leak from one of the Foshmark reactors. At 
Sandstep ordered approaches to the station sealed off. Local authorities issued a precautionary alert. A warning was broadcast on the radio instructing the population to keep its distance from Foshmark, and police set up roadblocks. 30 minutes later, Robinson was still in the lab at work on his new batch of samples when he heard sirens sound throughout the building. The entire plant was being evacuated. But by then, state nuclear and defense agencies in Stockholm had received reports of similarly high levels of contamination at a research facility 200 kilometers away from Foshmark. Air samples taken in Stockholm also showed elevated radiation and an isotope composition containing graphite particles, suggesting a catastrophic accident in a civilian nuclear reactor of one of a very different type from those in Sweden. By 1 p.m., the Swedish National Defense Research Institute had also modeled prevailing weather patterns across the Baltic. These established beyond doubt that the radioactive contamination hadn't originated in Foshmark at all. It had come from somewhere outside Sweden, and the wind was blowing from the southeast. Thank you, Adam. What, what drew you to this story initially? Um, well, I, was, I first began working on it uh, just for a magazine story in the run-up to the 20th anniversary of the accident uh, in 2006. And... Um, the reason I became interested in it was the sort of lamest journalistic reason of all, which was I was looking for a, uh, I was looking for a, a story to write, a, something that I could do that was deeply reported and historical. And I began looking at upcoming anniversaries. So I literally began going through the, the Wikipedia calendar for, uh, I think, 1996. I was looking at, you know, 10-year anniversaries. So there's nothing much there. And then I went, went back to 86. I was like, oh, there's, there's a lot happening in 86. And eventually, you know, got back to, to uh, April 86. And then thought of this. And I'd, but importantly, I've very recently read um, Walter Lord's book about the sinking of the Titanic, A Night to Remember, which, um, I, which I'd never read before. And it's this, you know, amazing, uh, very concise reconstruction of the events of just the night of the sinking of the Titanic. There's none of the, the, the run-up. There's none of the sort of background. And then there's none of the aftermath. Um, but it's extremely powerful. And, and Lord interviewed a lot of the survivors um, of the sinking when, when he worked on the book in the, in the 40s. And it struck me when I started thinking about Chernobyl that I could, I could write a similar magazine piece that was just about the night of the accident. Um, so I set out to try and find survivors and surviving eyewitnesses to the accident to write this short magazine piece and went to Moscow and, and Kiev on assignment for the Observer magazine in London. Um, but what happened is that as soon as I started talking to the first person I met, I realized that you know, all the English language versions of the, of the accident uh, narrative that I'd read before either missed huge amounts out or got things wrong. Um, and that the individual stories that, that I began hearing from these people were just amazing. Um, and so at that point, I, I wanted to write a book about it, but it took me you know, years to be able to convince anybody to let me do that. Do you read or speak Russian? Uh, no, I don't. Or Ukraine. In fact. Okay. Not, a, not a word of, well, I, I think I can say yes, no, please, thank you, and atomic energy station. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, very, very useful. Uh, yeah. Nothing else. Was there, was there one, who was, the, who was the interviewer, if there was one, that made you sort of say, if there are more stories like this, I have to tell them all? The first one. Uh, which was was Alexander Yevchenko and his wife Natalia, who um, who were the first people I met. I met them in Mos Moscow in the beginning of February uh, 2006. And just you know, as soon as Yevchenko began describing to me uh, what he had seen, it, first of all, I couldn't really the, you know the sort of the, the the cynical journalist part of my mind was initially just thinking, but this can't be true. I mean, it, nobody could be, could have stood and witnessed the things that he's witnessed and still be talking to me right. almost 20 years later. Um, but, so that part of the story was obviously compelling, but, but you know, what stayed with me was, you know, the, the, the wider story of his experience and, and the fact that he and Natalia had been, you know, in their mid twenties when this had happened. Um, and I began to realize that, you know, they hadn't, I was 17 when the accident happened. There, there wasn't really that much 
age difference between us. Um, and they were just not what I, who had been raised in the West during the Cold War, had expected, you know, former Soviet citizens to be like. They were much more like me than, than I imagined. Um, and their stories really stayed with me, you know, years after I first met them. And, and it was really that that brought me back to, to want to write their stories into a book. You, and, and they were residents of, of Pripyat, correct? Yes, yeah, they were. Um, I believe we ha we have a, a really terrific image of Pripyat. If we can put that up, that'd be amazing. Can you tell us what was what were the towns of Chernobyl and especially Pripyat like? Um, well, here's a, so this is a this is a view of uh, the bottom of Lenina Prospect, which is the main avenue leading into the city, um, and you can see that it it's a you know a pretty clean, open looking place, and it's filled with children. Um, and this was one of the first things that, that I discovered when I began talking to the Yevchenkos, was that I had imagined that living in a town of the Soviet Union, wherever you lived, was gonna be a kind of grim experience. And it was just gonna be a lot of uh, grim apartment buildings marching off towards the horizon. And that, that everybody you know who lived there was affected by the accident in a, in a sort of, in a stereotypical and predictable way, which is that their lives were miserable and limited before the accident. And then after the accident, they were miserable with extra added radiation. Um, but Pripyat in particular, because it had been constructed by the Ministry of Energy as, a, as an atom grad to accommodate the, the workers who worked at the power plant at Chernobyl um, and their families, it was designed to attract you know, the best specialists from around the Soviet Union. Uh, so it wasn't really like other cities. And, you know, many of the people that, that I spoke to who lived there, you know, had a wonderful life there. They really enjoyed it. it, it and, and so what they lost in the accident, in many cases, are not merely their health, but this kind of rather idyllic existence. Pripyat was built on the banks of a, of a sandy river. And in the summertime, you could go swimming and boating up the river. Um, and it had a lot of facilities that you didn't find in, in other similar sized Soviet towns. So it had like a beauty parlor, a nightclub, a discotheque, um, a yacht club, a scuba diving club, its own soccer team. Um, you know, and the shops were extremely well stocked with, with stuff that you couldn't buy in, even in big cities like Minsk and Kiev. It had five different types of sausage. They had um, you know, fresh tomatoes, which were a real delicacy in the Soviet Union at the time. And, you know, the other stores were shop stocked with things like French perfume and furniture manufactured in, in Austria. So it was, it was, you know, it was this really fantastic community and, and people really enjoyed living there. Well, and wasn't Chernobyl itself, the power plant, seen as a, an absolutely plumb assignment for yeah. a, a Soviet scientist or, or nuclear worker? Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I spoke to many people who'd come from, you know, literally all over the Union because they're attracted to this brand new plant, which was the most advanced, had the most advanced reactors of the country for generating electricity, um, you know, and, and only the kind of the, the top, the most highly qualified nuclear specialists were permitted to, to work there. Um, you do this really, really well in the book and this, this uh, I'm, I'm gonna somewhat give you a challenge on the spot uh, in terms of the science. Can, can, you, can you describe how it, I'm sorry, you knew this was coming, I didn't. Can, can, you just, can, you, can, you, can you briefly describe how, it, how a nuclear plant generates power? Because I bet a lot of people don't actually know how it works. Well, I mean, the, the, the kind of um, the slightly cop-out answer to the question is right. that a nuclear power plant generates electricity in exactly, in almost exactly the same way as any other kind of power plant. Right. Except that the, the source of heat is um, uranium fuel. So the nuclear reactor has uranium fuel rods in it in which a uh, nuclear chain reaction has started. And the chain reaction generates heat. And then water is passed through the core of the reactor uh, alongside the nuclear fuel. And that turns, the, that generates sufficient heat to turn the water into steam. And then the steam is piped away to turn a steam turbine. And the, tur the turning of the turbine um, generates electricity. Right. That's that's pretty much what I wanted. Just a, a type because because you know they can read the rest of it in the book. 
Well, um, I mean, I've, in, in the past, I have been put on the spot and asked to explain the, no, the, the nature of nuclear fission. Which <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. I'm a lot less comfortable. Um, one, of, one of the things that, uh, that, that, despite Chernobyl being a plum assignment, <laughs> and Pripyat being a, a, a somewhat, a somewhat idyllic town, they were all subject to the Soviet style of management, which you describe as the ultimate top-down management. Can, can you describe for us how the people who worked at the power plant were subject to that style of management and the effect it had on them? I'm thinking of uh, uh, Viktor Brukhanov, and Fomin and the leadership there, and sort of as a bridge to talk about the disaster itself, because this, I think, for me, was a key aspect of leading up to the disaster, is the Soviet style of management affecting decision making. Um, well, I think there's two aspects to it. One is that you've got this extremely dictatorial management system, um, where essentially you were, you were not encouraged to disagree with or argue with your managers or your uh, betters in the party system. Um, so you were given an order, and however unrealistic and preposterous it was, you, you were expected to follow it. Um, but the other aspect of things that made things very complicated that I didn't really understand about the Soviet system until I began reporting the book is that everybody faced uh, instructions from two masters because the... Uh, the state was constructed with two parallel management systems. One, there was the government and the, the um, subsystems of the government and the ministries of the government. And the other was the Communist Party. And although the Communist Party was ostensibly just supposed to be around to help organize the revolution at the beginning, it stuck around and became ossified. And so what happened is that somebody like Bruhanov answered both to his bosses at the Ministry of Energy in Moscow who you know, were specialists in energy production and electricity, but also to his party bosses, his, his managers within the party system. Um, and although the party was in charge, obviously the people in the party weren't necessarily qualified to be making decisions about electricity generation. Um, and he would often be given instructions from, from both groups of people. Um, so, and, and that would often make his, his position even more impossible and more untenable. Because not only was he being handed impossible targets to fulfill or quotas that were simply not possible, or you know, in the case of the construction of the station itself, he would have these meetings where he would be told by a party boss from here that you know, reactor number three would have to be complete by November. Uh, and they were having the meeting in September. And everybody sitting around the table knew that the place where the reactor was supposed to be completed was still a hole in the ground. But any objection would just be encountered, would, would, would just meet with a, with a screaming fit from the party boss. And, and so, you know, he would leave the meeting under the instructions to make sure this had happened, knowing it was impossible, and placing another screaming fit in December when the party boss came back to tell him, asking why it wasn't finished. Can you explain what the... Uh... I want to relate two questions. The RBMK reactor, which was sort of the, the star of this particular um, machine tragedy, um, and, and how it relates to what I think what you refer to as Soviet gigantomania. Because um, the, the RBMK reactor and RBMK themselves really play a massive role in this. And I, if you can talk about um, uh, how, how that, what that is and how that plays into the story. Well, the RBMK, um is, is, was problematic and, and, and resulted indirectly, its design resulted in, in the, um, ultimately in the accident, uh, largely because although they had, the Soviets had developed um, another kind of reactor which was, which was much safer, and is much more like the ones that are constructed in the West, pressurized water reactors, um, they lacked the ability to to manufacture them in large enough numbers to meet the targets that they had set out in Moscow to produce electricity from, from nuclear power. And they realized quickly that, that if they tried to meet all of these targets they had for electricity generation from nuclear power from these reactors, they'd never be able to do it. So they fell back on this far simpler 
of much less stable technology, which was the RBMK, uh, which was based on an old military design of nuclear reactor, which was actually designed to, to generate plutonium to build nuclear weapons. Um, and what they did is they took this other design of reactor and they simply scaled it up. They just made it a lot bigger than, than it originally was. It wasn't originally designed to, to generate electricity, but they sort of modified it so that it could. And then because they needed to make a lot of electricity, um, then they made the reactor a lot bigger. Um, and this resulted in directly in a series of instabilities, which made the reactor extremely hard to handle. Um, and one element of this instability was the fact that what the operators at the plants where these things were built quickly realized was that they were so massive that instead of operating one nuclear reactor, uh, it was like operating four different nuclear reactors in one because they were so huge that the nature of the fission reaction in different parts of the reactor would be different at the, all at the same time. So this made controlling them you know, extremely hard. They were very capricious, very difficult to deal with. And, you know, this is one of the most significant elements that, that actually led to the, the accident in the end. What was, what was the night of April 26, 1986 supposed to be like at Chernobyl? Uh, well, actually it was, it was supposed to be just a routine test that they were, they were carrying out because the reactor was due to be shut down for a regularly scheduled uh, period of maintenance. It had been online for three years. It was time to shut it down, fix a few things, keep it offline for a couple of months, and then bring it back online. And uh, they were using this opportunity to carry out a long overdue safety test. Um, so one of the many ironies of the story is that the accident was actually caused by them testing a safety system. Right. Uh, and, um, and so, the accident actually took place after the uh, reactor was supposed to have been shut down because the safety test was supposed to be conducted the previous day. Um, but because they were nearing a public holiday and the operators of the uh, Kiev electricity grid got wind of the fact they wanted to turn this reactor off and take it offline, um, they were told they couldn't do that because as, as the public holiday came up, everybody in the factories in Ukraine was desperately trying to meet their end of, end of month targets before the holidays. So they couldn't afford to have any electricity taken off the grid. So the reactor test was postponed and was carried out by people who weren't really ready to do it. Several of whom went to work expecting that they were just going to be sitting around watching a, a reactor that had already been turned off cooling for a couple. Can you walk us through the chain of events that evening leading up to Leonid Toptonov pressing the button to end what was supposed to be a standard test? What happened sort of in the moments right before the reactor began to melt down? So um, what happened is that the, um, the test was supposed to have been conducted by the previous shift of uh, operators in the, in the uh, control room of reactor number four, who went off shift at midnight. And they were replaced by the new shift who came on at 12. Um, and Leonid Toptonov, who was the uh, reactor control operator, who was, who was the person who was directly controlling um, the manipulation of the rods inside the reactor. Uh, when he took over at midnight, he made a mistake in uh, the way that he uh, reset the control panel on the, on the reactor. And that began a sequence of events that put the already unstable reactor into an even more unstable condition. And so then there are a series of steps taken because the mistake that he, that he made almost prematurely shut down the reactor before this test had begun. And under normal circumstances, if the level of reactivity in the reactor fell below a certain point, this, the regulation stipulated you should just turn it off and shut it down. Um, and that's what they should have done. But the guy who was in charge of running the test, Anatoly Dyatlov, who was the deputy chief engineer of the plant, um, and a widely feared individual within the plant, um, really, really desperately wanted this test to take place. Um, and so he 
insisted that contrary to regulations and contrary to the wishes and suggestions of the uh, operators on the panel in the control room, that the reactor be brought up to a kind of operating level of reactivity again so that the test could take place. And once that had happened, that was hard enough to do in the first place. But once that had happened, an accident was really inevitable. Um, and the reactor had become so unstable that all they needed to do at that point was to try and turn it off using the system of emergency control rods that was always used to turn the reactor off. And that would lead almost inevitably to a major accident, if not a massive explosion. Yeah, a question from, from, from Sam through the Q&A. So if you do want to ask a question, uh, please go put it in the Q&A function. I am, I am monitoring it. I'm trying not to distract myself too much. Um, the, the, the command structure of orders from the top down seems similar, he, he posits, from the structure that caused the Deepwater Horizon disaster. And he wonders if the Soviet system is all that dissimilar from the capitalist system. And he's wondering if he's wrong about that. And if there are spe specificities that make the two situations, obviously one is a, an oil rig, one is a nuclear power plant, that make them different in terms of command structure. I don't know, because I don't know anything about the Deepwater Horizon accident. Um, yeah. But I, I mean, I, it's hard to imagine that there's a kind of similar uh, system of a parallel political organization and a, and a kind of ordinary civilian government structure going on uh, that I'm aware of in, in capitalist government. But it, as I say, I don't know anything about Deepwater Horizon. Okay. Um, Despite what really seemed like an obvious disaster, the moment the, the reactor began to melt down in the aftermath, um, the leadership of the plant did not react in kind. How did they respond and why? Um, well, initially they, um, they took a very Soviet approach, which was, was because, because partly because of the nature of the, of the top-down system. Um, and partly because of the, the, the um, I guess, the temperament and the, the, the way in which uh, Soviet managers worked, uh, they tried to, to downplay the severity of what happened and suggest that everything was just fine. So what happened initially was that, that Viktor Brahanov, the director of the plant, sent out a report in which he said, which eventually reached Gorbachev's desk on Saturday afternoon, which suggested that yes, there had been an explosion, uh, there was a fire, but the fire had been put out. Um, one man was missing, another man was very unwell, and there were some people in the hospital with severe injuries. The radiation situation was complicated, and we're looking into it. Um, but you know, this the the report that Brahanov put his name on early on Sunday morning, obviously it gave no indication of the true severity of what had happened. Um, and, you know, after the accident, both within the Soviet Union and more widely, Rahanov was really faulted for, for attempting to cover things up and, and lying about what had happened. Um, but when I began looking more deeply into this, it's, there's, there was also something else going on, which you, I think you see in other severe accidents, which was that Rahanov and the other specialists even nuclear physicists who are experts and, and should have known exactly what was happening, were so overwhelmed by the enormity of the accident that had befallen them and the power plant that they were responsible for, that they simply couldn't comprehend the reality of, of what had happened. They either refused to believe or simply just couldn't get their heads around what had happened. Um, and that is something else that fed into the response for a long time, is that, that even people who had seen chunks of graphite clearly from the core of a disintegrated nuclear reactor lying on the ground, you know, said, oh, well, no, it must be from somewhere else. We're building another reactor up the street. And, uh, you know, there's been graphite lying around for that. It, it must be from that. Um, so there was, a, there was a lot of denial, uh, Soviet denial, but there was also, I think, a lot of a very sort of broadly human incapacity to, to comprehend the enormity of terrible events. Oh, sorry, Neil, I can't hear you. 
I muted myself. I was trying to be polite. That's what you get from that. Uh, you talk about the enormity of the challenge. Um, Daryl Jones asks, what sort of training did the fire brigades get in fighting a nuclear fire prior to the event? Talk about taking on a task that you were not equipped for. Um, they didn't uh, have, have training in, in handling a nuclear fire. They, they you know, they had, um, they had nuclear and biological and chemical protection suits, those big rubber suits that you see uh, that, that soldiers were issued with for use in the event of nuclear war. But they weren't trained to fight nuclear fires. And on all of the work that they'd done up to that point had been dealing with, you know, electrical fires at the power plant or fires caused by construction workers because the, the power plant was in a state of constant construction. They finished four reactors, but they were still building reactors number five and reactor number six. Um, and so these guys, had, you know, they, they had a, a pretty quiet life. They, there were two fire stations. One was, was dedicated to the, the Chernobyl plant itself and was literally right next to the plant. And the other one was the, the city fire station in Pripyat. Um, and these guys, you know, they'd be, they'd be called out to haystack fires or the people at the plant would be called to, to put out a fire in, caused by a bucket of, of bitumen being knocked over on a burner or something. Um, and, and one time there was a fire in some electrical tunnels in the basement and they went in and poured foam on it. And they were very well equipped to do that stuff, but nobody had ever trained them to, to put out a nuclear fire because such a thing was regarded as beyond the realms of real possibility. Um, I, I think I, I, I think we talked about this. So after after the the initial mistakes were made, <laughs> um, can you uh, within the horror of the disaster? This also gets at some of the language, but it also describes what the people in the plant witnessed. There's an incredible description. Uh, it's page ninety four into page ninety five. It's what Alexander Yevchenko saw. And I think as much as anything else I, I read in this book, it, it, it describes the, the enormity of what they were facing, but also the language of the writing. And I was wondering if you could share that with us. Sure, this is, I mean, this is actually, um, this is the scene that Alexander Yevchenko described to me that I was referring to earlier when I said that I couldn't quite believe. That right, oh great, good, good. good. Um, and from somewhere in the heart of the tangled mass of rebar and shattered concrete, from deep inside the ruins of Unit 4, where the reactor was supposed to be, Alexander Yevchenko could see something more frightening still. A shimmering pillar of ethereal blue-white light, reaching straight up into the night sky, disappearing into infinity. Delicate and strange, and encircled by a flickering spectrum of colours, conjured by flames from within the burning building and superheated chunks of metal and machinery, the beautiful phosphorescence transfixed Yuvchenko for a few seconds. Then Yuri Trego yanked him back around the corner and out of immediate danger. The phenomenon that had entranced the young engineer was created by the radioactive ionization of air and was an almost certain sign of an unshielded nuclear reactor open to the atmosphere. Thank you, and I think, um, I think uh, Daryl, that I think that answers your other question about whether people actually looked into the pile after the accident. The answer is, amazingly, yes. Well, he looked. He looked at it. At it. He didn't look. Yes. Okay. But he went subsequently. Did go with a group of his colleagues uh, to a point where they looked into it, hmm. um, but he was prevented from doing so with the result that they were dead within weeks, um, and and he survived. As, as, in, within the Soviet Union, I'm talking less about the government, how, how did the news spread beyond the town? How did people who were living, as you go in concentric circles away from the plant, begin to understand that something had happened? And how did the at least relative truth begin to get out? Well, I mean, in the, the initial hours after the accident, people in, in Pripyat itself, uh, began to learn that something had happened. Pripyat was deliberately built close to the plant. It was only three kilometers at the closest point um, from the plant to the periphery of the town. Um, and you know, most people had either members of their family or friends who worked at the plant. 
So uh, word began to filter into the town. Uh, but initially, most people who, who worked in the, who lived in the town didn't really understand how serious it had been. And this was partly because um, many of them simply refused to believe that an accident so serious was possible. Mm -hmm. um, but also there'd been quite serious accidents at the plant before. And, you know, nothing, nothing bad seemed to have happened. You know, there had been a partial meltdown in the first reactor of the plant in 1982. And although the people in the town weren't told about this, you know, a significant amount of radioactive material was released into the atmosphere. Um, but what happened is that the local government kind of quietly laid some new concrete down uh, Lenin the Prospect, that main avenue in the, in the photograph we looked at. Um, you know, and they had decontamination trucks sluice the streets with, with, uh, with foam. But, you know, the kids played in the foam in bare feet as the, as the trucks moved through the streets. And, and just everybody went back to work and, and, and nothing untoward seemed to happen afterwards. So they were kind of used to the idea that accidents could take place and that, you know, things would just move on. Um, and so nobody really panicked, you know, when the, when the evacuation finally came around. They, they really believed what they were, they were told, which was they were given the idea that they'd be evacuated and a couple of days later they'd all be able to come back. Um, but then, although the KGB had cut off the long distance telephone lines in the hours after the accident happened to deliberately prevent word of anything serious reaching the outside world, once the evacuation began to take place, then, you know, it was carried by word of mouth information about what had happened, you know, into the countryside around and then to Kiev and then, and then beyond that. Um, because the, the Soviet government did all they could to prevent word of it leaking out. And they didn't admit um, to the wider world that anything at all had happened until after the Swedes, uh, alerted by the workers at the Toshmark plant on Monday, um, revealed that something had happened. So it wasn't until wasn't for more than two days that the world outside was notified. Was there ever any planning for the town in the event of emergency accidents, or did they, were they in such denial on an official level that, this is a, a question from, uh, from Andrea, was there just such denial that they never even put an emergency plan into place if something were to happen? I know, they had a, they had, um, um, a quite extensive set of guidelines about evacuation in the in the event of a nuclear accident at a plant, um, but how did that bounce up against reality? However, the guidelines were were somewhat confusing, and the party officials who were in charge of deciding whether or not an evacuation should take place were extremely reluctant to let that evacuation happen. So they they were like, you know. One of the senior medical people on the staff uh, of the government commission that arrived from Moscow in the hours after the accident, you know, pointed out that they had a, a really pretty catastrophic nuclear accident on a similar scale uh, back in 1957 in, in, in Mayak, in the Urals. Um, but they hadn't evacuated anybody then. No, what, what, why on earth should we be back? Yes, yeah, sure, there's radiation in the atmosphere, but you know, it, it, this, is, this kind of thing happens not infrequently. We don't, we don't need to worry about this. Um, so, but they did, you know, they, they certainly did have um, regulations in place. It was just that there was disagreement about whether or not they should be enforced. But it would have to be said that, you know, for all the other things that, that went wrong in the handling of this accident, um, the evacuation itself went amazingly smoothly. I mean, they, they ordered up 1,200 buses from all around the area from Kiev and cities around Ukraine. Um, and they evacuated 27,500 people from Pripyat in the space of three hours. <laughs> um, and that, you know, that's something that, that really would take the planned colony to accomplish. The, uh, one of the things you mentioned in the book is that the Soviet Union was uniquely positioned to be able to bring huge amounts of uh, human and materiel to bear on an issue even if it was done often incompetently. Um, after the town is evacuated, uh, probably somewhat at the same time, a, a massive cleanup effort begins. Um, I know we've got 
um, a couple of images that I'd like to bring up. I wanted, I wanted to ask first about who is in charge of the cleanup at Chernobyl first and of the, the people who just were there to work, what, what drove them or did they have a choice to come and do the work that was beyond dangerous but had to be done? Well, so the organization of the, the cleanup was handled um, in two ways. First of all, there, there was a government commission uh, that was sent down from Moscow on Saturday morning, uh, immediately after the accident happened. And this stuck around in one form or another to take control uh, on the ground, on, in the field immediately uh, at the accident site. And then for, for years afterwards, um, and it was run under the auspices of a, of a special task force that was organized in Moscow. Um, so it, it, the task force existed to place at the disposal of the commission in Chernobyl itself, all of the resources of the Soviet Union. So, I mean, that's what you're talking about when the, the, essentially all of the tools of the planned economy, all of the resources of the whole Soviet Union were placed um, at the disposal of these people. So they were able to do, to eventually that they brought in over the course of the years that the cleanup took place, around 600,000 people uh, were rotated through what came known as the exclusion zone. Um, and in answer to the, to the second part of your question, you know, the, did these people have a choice? Not really, because, you know, in the initial phase, the people who were brought in were um, young military conscripts who were on active service, and they had a draft in the Soviet Union. Um, and so these were, were young draftees, but they, they rapidly were, were put into such dangerous circumstances because they lacked equipment, they lacked protective equipment, they lacked dosimetry equipment that would have indicated how much radiation they were being exposed to. Um, the military commanders began to realize that they would kind of sicken uh, the health of an entire generation of soldiers who they were expecting one day to have to defend the motherland against uh, the United States and its allies. And so, so they quickly called up all of the, the reservists that they could get their hands on. So these were people who had already done their draft service, already uh, been conscripted and rotated out. And when, you know, men in their 30s and their 40s um, who were regarded as a bit more disposable, and these people were just quite often just rounded up in the middle of the night without being told where they were going to go. They were, they were told they were going to have to perform special duties. And they were, you know, flown and bussed into the, into the exclusion zone and put to work. Um, and, the, and many of them didn't learn exactly where they were going or what they were doing until they arrived and they were being issued their uniforms. Um, and the images that we're seeing here uh, are of the... the groups of men who did some of the most um, potentially lethal work in the entire cleanup, which is to clean fragments that had been thrown out of the core of the reactor itself off the roof of the adjacent reactor number three building. Um, and this was work that was necessary uh, before they could try and completely cover up the ruins of reactor number four. And these guys were, um, were also young conscripts. Many of them were from fire training schools nearby in Ukraine. And I, I interviewed General Tarakanov, who was the commanding officer of these. They eventually rotated through 3,828 of these young men. Um, and, you know, the Soviet literature at the time in Pravda and um, Izvestia would have you believe that these men were all volunteers. It's a little bit more complicated than that. They were called up, they were told what they were going to do, and then Tarakanov took these men up to the roof of the building and then said, any one of you that does not want to participate in this duty can step forward now and you will be released. Um, and he said that uh, nobody ever said that they didn't want to do it. But obviously that's quite a different concept from volunteering. <laughs> um, and, you know, but, but afterwards, you know, a lot of them did say, that they, they felt the duty to perform this work because they knew if they didn't do it, then somebody else was gonna to have to. 
did uh, Steph is asking in the Q&A, did, 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 were there people who simply felt and understood in a deep way that they were being sacrificed for the motherland? Well, some of them wanted to, you know, there were people, this is a generation whose grandfathers and fathers had fought in the Second World War. And they, you know, there were those among them who responded to it as a, as a way of, of being able to perform the same sort of sacrifice for their country, their patriotic duty that their, you know, immediate ancestors had done. And so they, 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 there were a lot of, uh, of true believers. There are a lot of people who believed in the, in the future of the Soviet state, of the, of the socialist experiment, and they, they wanted to do this work for that. Um, I don't know to what extent many of them fully understood the, the severity of what they were um, going into. And quite often their commanding officers didn't know either um, because they were, they were ill-equipped, they didn't have dosimetry equipment, a lot of them were ignorant of the real risks. But on the other hand, there were, you know, there were plenty of scientists who understood very clearly exactly what they were dealing with. And they, either out of a sense of patriotic duty or scientific curiosity, um, wanted to go forward anyway. I, I interviewed one guy uh, who was a recently qualified physics student, and he actually um, went down to participate in the cleanup. And his parents were nuclear physicists. And he knew that if he told them where he was going, they would forbid him from doing so. So he wrote a handful of postcards from a place hundreds, thousands of miles away from Chernobyl and gave them to a friend of his to mail back to his parents to fool them into thinking that he was somewhere else and then went to work in Chernobyl. Um, and he so knew exactly what he was getting into. And, and uh, someone was, was asking, uh, the photographs, are, the amazing photographs, the, where, where did those photographs come from? Those are official documents, are they not? Those or, two pictures just then? Yeah. Uh, those were taken by um, an experienced combat photographer named Igor Kostin, um, who lived in Kiev, and he went down um, for quite long periods of time and, and, and took photographs there. Um, and he actually died just as I began reporting on the book, ironically, in a car accident yeah. in, uh, in Kiev. But um, yeah, those the interesting thing about those pictures that Kostin always said that you can see these kind of very pale marks these lines that look like sort of flood damage or something coming up from the bottom of the images. And um, Kostin said that, that that was where radiation had fogged the film from the sprockets of the camera. That's extraordinary. There's a couple of people asking about um, the human toll. And I think one of the most uh, powerful and, and difficult chapters of the book is Inside Hospital Number 6 which is what, what happened, who was in there and what happened inside hospital number six in the immediate aftermath of the disaster? Well, hospital number six was a, was a, was a specialized radiological ward where um, there was set up as a, as a part of the Ministry of Media and Machine Building, which was this entity that handled all of the uh, nuclear weapons um, manufacturing in the, in the Soviet Union. Um, and they had this special radiological hospital that was set up explicitly to treat victims of radioactive accidents. So, you know, it was where the victims of explosions on nuclear submarines or people who were inadvertently exposed in weapons factories were sent to be treated. Um, and because they'd had so many of these accidents over such a long period of time, relatively speaking, since 1947, you know, the staff at hospital number six had some of the most uh, widespread experience in treating radiological injuries of, of any any doctors in the world um, and this is where the the most acutely exposed victims of the accident who were exposed uh, in the immediate aftermath of the explosion so the operators within the plant and the firefighters who fought the fires on the roofs of the buildings outside the plant um, in the in the early hours of the morning those guys 128 of them were flown for treatment at hospital number six. Um, but the most severely injured among them had been exposed to such high doses of radiation that almost as soon as they were admitted, 
uh, the doctors of the hospital knew that, that there was nothing that they could do for them um, and that they were going to die. Um, and so those people included the 31 uh, victims of the accident who, who, who died in the, in the immediate months after the explosion, which, is, which was for a long time in the Soviet Union regarded as the entire official death toll of the accident of those, those 31 people. But they're the people who died of acute radiation syndrome. Does, does anyone have an idea, because this is a question a couple of people have asked, does anyone have an idea of what the actual uh, human cost, leaving aside the environmental cost, what the actual human cost of the disaster is in the end? Uh, if you're talking about the number of deaths, um, all we have are estimates, and that's, that's partly because the Soviet government did, did as much as they could to sort of cover up the, the, the true health consequences of the accident almost from the minute it happened. Uh, but also because the epidemiology of, of, of radiation exposure is very complex. And you know most of the deaths that would be caused directly by radiation would uh, deaths from cancer. Um, and it's almost impossible to directly attribute um, deaths from cancer to to radiation exposure. Um, so it, it, those two things really sort of fog the picture. Um, all we have are estimates. The best and most reliable ex, um, um, the, the best and most reliable estimates that we have, sorry, um, uh, uh, come from some work done by Elizabeth Cardis, who's this doctor and radiological expert in France, an epidemiologist. Um, and her figures are that out of the populations most directly affected by the, by the disaster in Belarus, Ukraine, and the Russian Republic, which is about five million people in those countries who are directly affected, um, that there would be between five and 10,000 deaths that could be directly attributed to the accident. You can see statistically out of a population of five million, 10,000 is, is a kind of tiny fraction of the overall population. Um, so not as many as many people would expect, but at the same time, these figures are just estimates. The, the, the Soviet Union was at a, a particularly interesting time at the time of this disaster. Um, the leader at the time was, of course, Mikhail Gorbachev. And how long had he been in power at this time? And I believe we have a, 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 a very uh, sort of, uh, people will remember this kind of image of Gorbachev if we can bring that up. Um, but he was, he was, how long had he been in power at the time? Yeah, this is, so this is, he had literally just arrived in office. He was, uh, he was appointed um, in the, at the end of 1985, which is a, around when this picture was taken. Um, and, you know, he arrived after a whole series of, of sort of geriatric and alcoholic um, animated corpses that occupied the, the position of chairman of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Um, and so he seemed, you know, vital and exciting and, you know, represented the possibility of reform. And, and uh, Chernobyl really represented uh, the acid test of his promise of, of change. Um, because he'd, he'd only recently announced these ideas of Glasnost of open government and perestroika of restructuring in the economy um, at the recent Congress of the Soviet Union, which was, I think, uh, Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was like maybe six weeks before the accident. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at that point, they were just slogans, these ideas of Glasnost and perestroika. And the first real test came when they had to make a decision about whether they were going to admit what had happened at the plant. Of course, they didn't. So, you know, <laughs> so, um, so it turned out at, at that point that, you know, the old ways were going to obtain for a little bit longer. Um, but then eventually Gorbachev decided that, that he was going to allow more open reporting on what happened and sent, allowed, you know, uh, Soviet reporters to enter the exclusion zone and begin reporting relatively openly on what had happened. Um, and this was one of the many things about the accident that, 
that you know ultimately contributed pretty significantly to the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in 1991. Um, I, I just wanted to say to people who are who are joining us, first of all, again, thank you. Oh, yeah, the, the questions you're submitting are excellent. We have far, far more than I could ever ask Adam in five sessions. So if I, if I, if I do skip over a question, it is not personal. I have four pages of questions. I'm not getting all mine either, I swear. Um, I'm, I'm here all night then. That's, that's true, that's true. It's, it's exactly. early. It's, uh, we, we, can, we can go to California time. Um, so the, what, is, what is the area around Chernobyl like now? And there's an a excellent question in, in the Q&A that I think is related. Um, that uh, asking about nuclear tourism, and I, but I want to talk about sort of what the area is like now and what the town of Pripyat is like now. And were you were you ever actually in Pripyat proper? And I think we can we can look at the uh, the two photos, one of which is somewhat amusing and one of which is somewhat um, breathtaking. So so the answer to your your second question was. Uh, Yes, I, I went to Pripyat a lot. I mean, when one of the, the sort of the unfortunate consequences of, um, of the way the accident happened is that, that Pripyat was essentially turned into a ghost town almost overnight and left pretty much as it was on the day of the evacuation, which meant that, that in order to reconstruct, you know, where people lived and their routes around the town and things in the days before the accident and on the night of the accident, I was able to just go and, and kind of visit their apartments and to retrace their steps. Um, but as you can see from this picture, which I took from the, from the roof of one of the highest buildings in the city, um, you know, it's now been almost completely reclaimed by nature. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of a fascinating place to visit um, because it is like a, it's a time capsule of, of the Soviet times, um, but is gradually being completely reclaimed by you know, trees and wildlife. Um, and in, in the summer, it's, it's, it's a, or late spring, which is when I took this picture, it's a kind of amazing place because it's a completely deserted city where, you know, you walk down these broad avenues and all you'll hear is, is birdsong and, and, you know, you'll see poplar dander floating on the breeze in front of you. And it, it's, it's kind of magical, but at the same time, uh, pretty frightening because you get a real sense of, you know, the world after us. Um, you, you don't have to be there very long before you get a sense of what it would be like to be the last living person on earth. And as far as uh, the, the other image, which was a uh, kiosk. Ah, yes, so, so this, well, the, I have to admit that this is something that's happened since I last visited, because I finished my reporting there in 2017. You know, and I, by that time I'd been reporting there for, for, from, in various different ways for you know more than more than ten years, uh, but this uh, picture of this <laughs> Chernobyl souvenir booth where they sell sort of radioactive themed tchotchkes and T-shirts and mugs and stuff um, has only sprung up in the last couple of years, um, and uh, you know there's been the, partly it's because the Ukrainian government in the bid to kind of make money out of the exclusion zone, you know, really opened it up for tourism. Uh, but there's also been, a, you know, there's a whole generation of, of sort of selfie driven tourism where people want to have experiences and take pictures of themselves doing it and then, then um, post it on Instagram, which has really driven people visiting the city. And you can, you can take tours that, you know, leave in the morning at eight o'clock from Kiev, you get on a bus, they'll drive you out there, it takes a couple of hours, you, you're de decanted from the bus, uh, in the middle of the town, and you'll you'll get shown around the sort of they'll show you the the fro the Ferris wheel that was due to be opened on May the first, nineteen eighty six, that nobody ever used. They'll show you the uh, the empty swimming pool. You know they'll they'll hit all the hot spots, as it were, and then you get back on your bus and you'll be taken to the plant. Um, and if I think if you get the special tour, you'll you'll have lunch in the cafeteria of the plant. And then you'll be, you know, home in Kiev for a, in time for a cocktail in the evening. Um, the ethics of that to you? What's that? The ethics of that to you? Do you have any feelings about that? Well, I mean, 
I mean, I, I think I'm afraid I take a rather practical view of it, which is that, that it brings a lot of money into Ukraine at a point mm. when, when it could do with it. Um, you know, there's the annually, um, they open up all the, the, the gates on the, the perimeter of the exclusion zone every April the 26th so that the former residents of the town can come back and visit their own homes um, mm. or their old homes. Um, but the place is not being preserved. Uh, there's an, there is a sort of small effort underway to kind of preserve it as a monument to both the accident and to the, to the Soviet Union. Um, but it's, it's many of the buildings now are in danger of collapse. You're not allowed to to actually go inside any of them because you, you, you something could fall on your head. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, is it you know the is it sort of dismirching the memory of the victims of the accident to have this kind of thing happen? I guess you could argue that, but I don't know whether those people and their families would, would look at it that way. And I must admit, I'm, I've never really discussed that part of it with them. Hmm. Um, the Chernobyl power plant is still operating. No, it's not. It was, uh, the obviously the fourth reactor was destroyed and could, was, was never going to work again. They brought the other three reactors back online within a year and a half of the explosion. Um, and the last of those reactors was not shut down until 2000. But they've, all of them um, are now in the process of being dismantled and decommissioned. So no, they haven't, haven't been in operation for, for 20 years. So. And, and are the challenges of dismantling them as great as the challenges of the, the how great are the challenges of dismantling them? I think that, that the, um, there's nothing special about dismantling the, the reactors that were continuing to operate. Right. Um, it's, <laughs> it's no more difficult than dismantling any decommissioned nuclear reactor anywhere else. <laughs> um, <laughs> Even a caveman. Yeah. What's that? Even a caveman could do it, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't want to try it with, you know, a box of, of wrenches in it and a pair of rubber gloves. Um, but no, but the, the, um, the ruins of reactor number four encased in this structure that they called the sarcophagus, um, which was this massive building of, of uh, concrete and steel, much of which had to be put up by remote control. Which I think, I think we actually have an image of the sarcophagus. Yeah, yeah. Right? Image number, we can take a look at that. It is an extraordinary um, engineering feat in the most impossible of circumstances. There it is. Um, so the Soviet engineers who built this you know, managed to convince everybody, the Soviet government managed to convince everybody that this was a sort of massive concrete structure, impenetrable, impenetrable, impenetrable to radiation. Uh, but the truth is that actually only the walls are made of, of concrete and the roof was just a sort of steel shed. Hmm. Um, so although you talk to some of the engineers who built it now and they say, well, it was designed to last a hundred years, um, it started leaking uh, pretty soon after they finished it in November 1986. Um, and eventually, uh, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development uh, helped foot the massive bill for building uh, another sarcophagus over the top of this, which was only just completed in 2017. Um, and that was built with the intention of both containing the old sarcophagus and the sort of the melted ruins of the melted reactor number four that's, that's inside it, um, and also providing an environment in which they could dismantle all of this stuff and make it safe. Um, and they built this kind of, these robotic cranes and things and a very sophisticated air conditioning system to make this possible. But it, when I was reporting on it, it, it rapidly became clear that although they built the structure over the outside, the, the, what was inside remained so dangerous that they didn't really know how it was going to be possible to dismantle it and make it safe. Um, and the, you know, the Ukrainian government and the European bank has talked about making this into a greenfield site where, you know, you and your family will be able to spread a picnic blanket and, you know, <laughs> eat some sandwiches on the surface of what used to be reactor number four. But I spoke to um, this guy, Sergei Parishin, who, who used to be the, um, the head of the Communist Party self of the plant and, the, and basically the sort of deputy in charge of the plant at the time of the accident, uh, who's now a consultant for the Ukrainian government about just this project. And, mm. and I said, um, 
at one point I said, "Would well, you, you know, so again, do, do you think, w w when do you think it's going to be possible for this to be completely cleaned up and transformed into a greenfield site? And he said, uh, and Sergey is like now in his late 60s, and he said, he said, you and I and Elon Musk will be living on Mars by the time that happens. <laughs> um, so I want to I want to I want to ask uh, one one final question again. I want to thank everybody who who put in questions. They're great questions. I'm so sorry we don't have the time to get to all of them. Um, and for those people buying uh, buying a book, just a note that a book plate will come separately from the book. The book will come from one place. The book plate will come from another. And we'll be making those arrangements in the next couple of days. And we'll reach out to everybody to make sure everyone knows what's happening. Um, you, you spent a, a tremendous amount of time writing this book. And uh, I, I was wondering, given the subject matter, given the human cost, what was, what was the emotional effect of writing this book for you? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I was, my, the overwhelming um, emotional effect was one of obsession, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I just, because it was, it was it's, it's such a huge, all-encompassing story that, that has so many different aspects and has at its heart the experiences of all, all these different people. Um, you know, that, that, that I really wanted to be able to tell their stories and to re reflect their experience as accurately as possible. Um, and, it, you know, I could have carried on reporting it for years yeah. um, because, you know, I, I you know, developed relationships with a lot of these people, and, but, I, but also I just became fascinated with kind of every tributary of the story. Uh, and, and in the end, I just had to, you know, I had to force myself to adhere to a deadline because otherwise I'd, st I'd still be doing it now <laughs> and, and no book would exist. Um, but it, you know, I, I really, I really wanted, I, you know, I became really fixated on, on this story because I felt that it was one that people didn't really know the truth about. And if, and if I could tell it in the right way, that they would, they would be able to understand more about what, you know, not merely the, the victims of this accident experience, but what life in the Soviet Union was really, was really like, um, and so I, I just, I, I really got kind of possibly overly immersed in it. Well, I, I, I can't imagine anyone doing more justice to, to the story than you've done in this remarkable book. Uh, I, I, I can't encourage people enough to get this book. Um, you won't be able to put it down and you will tell everyone you know about it. And that's okay. Because it is, I think, Adam, you've told one of the great stories of the 20th century and told it incredibly well and I just wanted to say thank you for for doing this and allowing me to have this conversation with you and I want to thank everyone for coming thanks to Nadine and the National Arts Club and um, thank you again Adam and thank you. Um, it's been great I really yeah, appreciate it. it's my pleasure and in, until the next time thank you all very much and I hope everyone has a good evening thank you